If you've ever been grocery shopping, you've probably noticed there's a certain kind of person who stands longer than um, most folks might think necessary in front of the refrigerated section where they keep the milk. And that kind of person checks well nigh every carton of milk for that sell by date. And tempting to get the, the newest carton of milk, usually all the way in the back, so that they have uh, the longest stretch of time in order to consume that milk. Here's a confession. I am that kind of person. I've kept many <laughs> a shopper waiting while I checked all the dates on all the milk products, uh, making sure I had the freshest possible milk to bring home. Because I'm also this kind of person, the kind of person who, as soon as we're in uh, a short distance to that sell by date, uh, uh, I become very leery of the milk or the eggs or the meat or whatever you know, um, product I might be consuming. Um, it's, it's not quite exactly the stroke of midnight on uh, the date in question that I uh, abandon uh, a food product, but it's probably not terribly far off for that. It's one of those things that's just always uh, made me a, a little anxious and uncertain to consume date, to consume products past this, um, you know, really sort of, um, uh, date that, that in truth doesn't, doesn't, um, mean a whole lot. Um, it's really, uh, past when a product is, um, at its peak. It's, it's past when it might taste as good as it possibly could. It, it's, it's really not about, uh, you know, a life or death situation. And yet I'm, I remain to this day a teensy bit leery about those dates they print on food products. I like things to be new, right? Or at least I like food products to be new. Makes me wonder what if other things in our lives might have, um, you know, sell by dates or use by dates on them. Uh, what, if, what if our clothes uh, came uh, uh, with, a, with a date on the tag on the back that said, don't wear this any longer than, um, you know, 2015, because I can assure you I'm still wearing plenty of things that, um, that are well past their uh, sell-by date, um, uh, well, well out of style. Um, and uh, past the uh, point when uh, anyone would uh, consider them stylish, if anyone ever did. What if some of our relationships, you know, had a had a sell by date? Um, what if uh, you know our hairstyles had a sell by date? Actually, in fact, our hairstyles do. I, I am told I am officially old uh, because I don't have a middle part. I'm reliably informed of that by Instagram. Um, but there's, there's uh, a lot in our lives that we might benefit from if they had a bit of a sell by or use by date. I've been thinking about that as I contemplate this text from the gospel according to Mark uh, that we've heard this morning. This text where Jesus is uh, sort of questioned about why his disciples don't engage in particular practices that the Pharisees have doubled down on uh, around fasting and, and table fellowship. And Jesus' reply has to do with new wine and old wineskins and new fabric and old cloaks. What is all of that about? I think Jesus is suggesting that there are some practices that, uh, as far as the church is concerned, might be somewhat past their use by or sell by date. Uh, people come to him and they're comparing Jesus and his disciples to what the Pharisees have got going on over here. And the Pharisees are fasting well uh, uh, more often than is even remotely required. 
the Pharisees uh, are fasting twice a week when nobody else is probably even fasting once a week. And that seems to some who are observing from the outside to make them holier um, and, and uh, perhaps better than Jesus and his disciples who really have a more celebratory vibe going on. And so they're, they're quizzed, you know, why, why haven't you adopted uh, to an even greater degree, perhaps, this practice of, of fasting? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make you holier? If, if something that is good, uh, wouldn't it be better doing it twice or three or four times as often? And Jesus says, you're looking at this in the the wrong way. It's a new time. Um, and, and my presence makes uh, this a new experience. And you're, you're looking to embrace and double down on um, old practices. When what I'm calling people to do is to turn and to look um, at what might be possible now and what might make uh, a difference in people's lives now. It, it's as uh, Paul writes in the second chapter of, in the, in the second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Everything has become new. This is what it means to live in Christ. Uh, discipleship means embracing all things made new. And if we're new wine, then uh, we have no place in old wineskins. And if we're new fabric, then we're not useful uh, on an old, well-worn, well-washed cloak. New things call for new things. And yet, mm, you know, the people of Christ, the church, Jesus' disciples can be just, just the teensiest bit intransigent. If you spend any time at all around church people, you know that's true. You know, we sort of like our old customs and our old ways and, um, you know, perhaps no uh, phrase is uh, more frequently heard uh, in uh, churches than, well, we've always done it this way. What might it mean if we instead remembered that we were a new creation, that a new creation invites us and even requires us to embrace new ways of being, new habits, uh, new practices, new relationships, new experiences, a, a, a new creation calls us into all sorts of new opportunities. And we are far too often very, very willing and ready um, and, and happy to hang back and stick with all that is old and familiar, everything that we're used to, everything that we're comfortable doing. The, the church is called to be a place, a community that shows people through all that we say and all that we do that their lives could be different and better. Too often, what people see when they look at the church and its, um, its people is uh, old wineskins and old well-worn cloaks that, that don't really suggest that things could be different and better and more whole and more complete and, and more full. Sometimes we stick to old relationships and and old ways and old habits and old customs that don't really improve our lives or our well being or our health or our mental health. So often we stick to old ways that, that really don't serve us. So, so often we, we, we 
become committed to things that are well past their usefulness and their use by date in our lives. And I want to remind you this morning that to follow Christ is, is an invitation, not only to going new places, but to getting there in new ways. Well, there's two kinds of, of, of hikes that I'm aware of. One is what's called an out and back. Um, and it's real convenient because you you um, go towards a peak or whatever sort of the end of your destination is, and then you turn around and follow the, the same track back. Now, this is convenient because your car's there, right, at the trailhead. If you want to do a more challenging and, uh, you know, sl a slightly uh, perhaps more interesting hike, you might need to end up at a place that's different from the one that you started at. But you're likely to need help with that. You're likely to need a friend, park their car um, at the end of the hike and pick you up and take you home or back to your vehicle. You know, you can't do those uh, as easily and conveniently um, but you end up someplace new. And Christ calls us into a life that's full of new opportunities and new challenges. In order to achieve any of those, it's very likely that we're going to need to do things in new ways. The hardship in that is it also requires us usually to give up doing something in the old way. And so my, my real question for you this morning is, is what might you embrace that's new and different and challenging, but that might bring you someplace remarkable and wonderful, and, and also might allow you to bring others along into this new and wonderful and, and, and exciting moment. A corollary to that, though, is what are you willing to give up, to lay aside? And that's a question for us as a congregation as well. As we enter into a post-pandemic experience, we're not there yet, but we're looking ahead. We're looking towards it. As you enter into um, uh, thinking about what's going to be different on the other side of this last year plus, some things are going to change by necessity. And that will require of us some grief. Um, but I want it also to give us some optimism and some hope and some enthusiasm and some excitement. The truth is you and I all need a real shot in the arm, something that renews and restores and revitalizes us, something that will give us energy and excitement, something that encourages us. And I want to invite you to embrace thinking about what can be new and different on the other side of this for you as an individual, for your families, and for us as a community of faith. Let's not be thinking about when we can go back and do things just exactly like we used to. Let's be thinking about what new thing is there now space to bring into my life and into my relationships and into my spirit and into my soul because I've finally realized I need to let go of those things that are holding me back and, and keeping me stuck. What do you want to do different and what do you need to let go of in order to make that happen? Here's the thing about those, you know, sell by dates. The truth is drinking milk that's a day or two or maybe even three or four or five uh, is not gonna kill you. 
but it begins not to taste great and begins not, you know, to serve you or your purposes well. It's probably just as well to, you know, give it the smell test. Eh, it's just doesn't smell bad, so it's probably fine. There's a, there's a good many things in your life uh, that, you know, it's not going to kill you if you don't give them up. They probably smell fine, but they're not leading you into being the person you could and want to be. And they're, and they're not offering you relationships um, that fill your life with the best of all things. And there's things among us as a community of faith that, um, you know, they're fine, but if we were brave and excited and hopeful, we could figure out things that we could do better that would enrich our lives and other people's lives we haven't yet reached yet in remarkable and wonderful and joyful ways. And I want this time of preparing for a post-pandemic world uh, to be a space for us to think about what that, that might look like and be like. Um, I was not ready to go online <laughs> this time last year. Well, truthfully, I wasn't ready um, to go online even like last summer, uh, uh, but we had to. And so here we are. And there is very much a part of me that would be perfectly ready not to have to figure out how to do this once we get back in the sanctuary, but that's no longer one of our choices. And that's actually really a great thing. And I think there are parallels to that in our congregation and in your families and, and in your lives. So it's time to start rooting around and figuring out what is just taking up space that might be filled by something that's no longer past its sell by date. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.